Perhaps he's one of the best known faces in India. He's certainly one of the most talked about personalities and without doubt he's the most widely read author in the country. But do we really know him or are we just prisoners of a reputation that precedes him each and every time? Let's see if today he lets us catch a glimpse of the man behind the image as we meet Kushwan Singh. I have to say, looking at all the things you've been, a lawyer, a diplomat, a scholar, an editor, an MP, a novelist, a gossip columnist, are you a man for all seasons or are you a jack of all trades? Well, you've left out the dirty old man of Delhi. That's usually the way they describe me <laughs> in most of the media. Uh, I have, uh, like anyone else, varied interests and I've expressed them myself in those different fields. I dabbled with politics, I've written about scandals, I've written about nature, I've written about women. Being an iconoclast, I also write about uh, the joys of life, of drink and flirtation, all that. That's what's given me the bad image uh, in this country. Okay, let's try and see if I can catch a glimpse of the man behind all these different aspects of what you call the bad image. You were born in a village called Hadali, yeah. a desert village in Pakistan, yeah. to a family that traces its ancestry back to camel traders, I believe. Well, not camel traders. We This village was about 40 miles south of the Kura salt mines. And so my ancestors used to buy rock salt from the Kura salt mines, take them in camel caravans to cities in Punjab, mainly Amritsar and others and get from there in return tea, sugar, oil, cooking oils and things like that and come back in the camel caravan. So the childhood is largely in a Haveli and outside were dozens of uh, camels uh, tethered. So one was brought up with camels and buffaloes and that kind of village atmosphere. There's a story I gather that your grandfather Sujan Singh was blessed by a Muslim peer and that the family fortune and fame can be traced back to this incident. Yeah, well, that's the legend, that there was a flood once, and the, the waters came down, swept down the Kevra salt range to our village, and this fellow had a little a hermitage, and that was taken with the flood. He was on top of the thatch roof, and he was drawn towards our village, and he had nothing with him. He lost everything that was in his little dargah, and my grandfather looked after him, clothed him, fed him in the village and kept him there. And he blessed the, he said, he had two sons, my grandfather. And one, he said, I'll give you the keys of Delhi to one and I'll give the keys of the Punjab to the other. Now this is vast exaggeration. My father came to Delhi and became a builder and built a tidy fortune. My uncle joined politics and became a finance minister and then governor of Tamil Nadu. So to that extent, that prophecy was fulfilled. And into this, if I may call it, rural idyll, you were born in 1915. But I gather no one remembers the exact date and you had to make up your own birthday. Yes, because, you know, in our villages, we didn't have this system of recording births and deaths. And uh, in our families, nobody had horoscopes. So you vaguely remember, it's only when I came to Delhi, uh, age of five, and joined modern school, that I had to be at the giving end of all birthday parties. I didn't know such a thing. I was constantly having to take presents to other uh, children's birthday parties. And I said, it can't be one-way traffic. So I decided to have one of my own. And what did you choose? Well, it was the one that my father registered me is February 1915. And when the boys and girls came carrying little parcels, my grandmother was watching and she said, what are all these boys and girls doing here? I said, I'm celebrating my birthday. She said, don't be silly. You were not born in winter. You were born in Bhadon. She, the summer months, uh, the World War had been on for a year. And so I worked out by her calculation. It turned out to be August 15th, because it was middle of Bhadon. And I did, uh, uh, was prophetic. I gave India its birthday too. <laughs> Without realizing that Without, was going to happen. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, in those days, in fact, you used to attend the village school in Hadali, and I gather from your own essay that you had to battle with pie dogs. What sort of school All, was it? Well, they, you know, we went out from, and the pie dogs were waiting. My grandmother had leftovers of the meal the evening before, 
and she'd tear little bits of chapati and throw it to them. So they accompanied us right up to the school, to the tiny uh, school attached to the village Gurdwara. And all we were taught was the Gurmukhi alphabet and the morning That prayer. you wrote on old-fashioned slates? Oh, yes. So uh, wooden slates with a uh, reed pen and dipped in uh, uh, ink made of soot, which we had in little mud uh, ink bottles. And we went there and worked on it and came back. And then you had to wipe out all that and with what they call gachni mitti. It is a yellow uh, kind of clay. So it's really true to say that your childhood, in a sense, was another country. Well, that's been a great asset uh, because my roots are in the dung heaps of Punjab villages. I feel quite at home. But in fact, you left, as you call them, the dung heaps and went abroad for many, many years. No. One of the more exciting jobs you did was with Krishna Menon immediately after independence and what for many consider the golden years of India's relationship with Britain. Yeah. What was that mercurial man like? Very difficult, very edgy, uh, witty, he, at other people's expense. He couldn't take any uh, jokes at his own expense. Uh, he was a strange character, I think, in principle he believed that uh, only stupid people tell the truth, that to be a clever man you had to tell a lie. And he had always saying no to everything that you suggested, so he worked out, I worked out a system and I wanted something done. I put it in the negative and he was sure to approve of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I got on very well with him for a long time. So well, in fact, I gather that he once whisked you away because he said, Khushwan Singh, I don't like the clothes you wear. That's right, I used to wear the usual, you know, uh, sweater and tie, and this was not done. He wanted a good Savile Row tailor. I thought he was giving me a gift. He just took me out one day from the office, had me measured, and I had to pay a hefty bill, a Savile Row tailor. <laughs> so he dressed you at your own expense? That's right. <laughs> okay, you became, if I can so put it, a household name for this country when really in 1969 you became the editor of the Illustrated Weekly. Mm -hmm. A lot has been written about your editorship, but as you look back on it, was it for you a very happy and productive time? Well, it, it really established me as a journalist. I can say I'd started writing earlier for newspapers, and I think real break came in 65, when I was asked to do a lead article for the New York Times magazine section to explain the Indo-Pak War of 1965. And thereafter, I didn't look back. Uh, many articles appeared in the New York Times, and then I was offered the illustrated weekly job. Uh, and. Uh, it was such a wretched magazine, you know, it was only found in dentists' waiting rooms and, and all it had were pictures of people who got married or cocktail parties and tittle-tattle, that kind of you thing. You changed that in a big yeah, way, I, didn't you? I just, I, it was very simple. Since I'd been teaching in the States, I realized how little I knew of my own country. I got to know it because I had to teach India, comparative religions, Hinduism, Sikhism, Islam. And I said, if I don't know, my countrymen don't know either. So I had a three-pronged attack in the weekly, inform, amuse, provoke. And it worked as a formula. Provoke yeah. was mainly the yeah. sex elements, wasn't it? The sense well, of spreads, the that dubious, <laughs> dubious, dubious <laughs> <laughs> Well, I always did it very cleverly, because I'd have a, a, a tribal last with nothing on the up, another upper bare bosom. But instead of making, uh, giving her measurements or something, I give factual account of where the tribe was found, how many <laughs> there were, what they did. So I made it, made people look at the picture and learn at the same time, right. and it worked very well. But the funny thing is that, you know, this image that one has of you, of a scotch-drinking, dirty story and dirty joke-telling womanizer, was actually a creation of that period. What people don't realize, that it was a creation of your own, and it's actually not the truth. Well, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's both. I mean, you know this, we are a nation of sanctimonious humbugs. Uh, what we practice one thing and, uh, and preach something quite different. And this riled me very much. And I said, I'll cock the snook at this home, my entire society. If I drink, I'll drink right in the open and stand for drink as my birthright. Uh, if I like beautiful women, I'll say that, that they are beautiful on their faces or write about them, describing them. 
and it immediately started upsetting people and they said we mustn't take this magazine it's not no longer a household magazine this fellow's made it vulgar but on the other hand uh, it started shooting up and double treble four five times the circulation and it did in fact establish me as a journalist and a writer of light gossip and in fact the truth behind that formula of success was that defy them and they'll buy it that's right kick them on the ass and they'll respect you and you enjoyed the kicking too <laughs> yes i did <laughs> i enjoy provoking my countrymen they are really so smug satisfied and not curious about anything and i think it's worth provoking them but the sad part is that those 10 glorious years ended very abruptly and very badly didn't they yeah it was it's a very sad day for me because i'd run out i'd had two or three extensions in my contract i was due to retire i accepted the retirement my successor had been appointed he worked with me for a few days i had a week left in office only one week and i arrived one morning and i handed a note asking me to leave the office immediately so i just picked up my umbrella and walked out and i said how how discourteous can an employer be and i think they regretted it later because the weekly came down and then ultimately died out the end of the illustrated weekly meant that you were then almost full time a columnist and an author i know you did a couple of spells more as editor but increasingly your time was taking up with writing books has that then been the fulfillment of your dreams and your personality well i've done an enormous amount of writing and as i don't hesitate saying any rubbish i write gets published so a whole lot and you sometimes don't hesitate to write the rubbish either yes, right. well that somebody said that you made uh, uh, what did he call bullshit into an art form and i thought that was a correct description i this is the editor of the times of india at that time and he meant it very caustically and i told him i said you try and turn bullshit into an art form you see how hard it is to you, do it you you wear the <laughs> you wear the badge with pride that's right <laughs> <laughs> but see the funny thing is that when you were poised to publish your first book train to pakistan the young lady who was typing up the manuscript for you finished her job and turned around and said this book's a disaster it's not going to sell i know i was going to enter it for the grave uh, grove press award for the best word of work of fiction from india and this was uh, Uh, the american wife of a in british diplomat her name was tatty bell very lovely woman and she promised to type it out for me i entered it into the grove press uh, a competition under a assumed name because one of the judges was krishna menon so you and wanted to other, enjoy it and take <laughs> that i didn't want to take that risk uh, and so it was entered under the name of a friend of mine called i am verma and tatty said she said you're wasting your time this is no good the this is, and when it won the award uh, and, and the real name was disclosed that i was the author of the book it was tatty who came to me and said i'm sorry i made a mistake <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely story we're going to have to take a small break there i want to come back in part 2 and talk to you about the other reason why you became such a big household name in this country your close friendship with the gandhi family and also ask you to reflect a little on what you think's happened to india since then but first a little commercial break see you in a moment Welcome back to Face to Face. My guest is Kushwan Singh. Alongside your editorship of the Illustrated Weekly, the other reason why people really got to know you was your close relationship with the Gandhi family. When did you first meet Indira Gandhi? First, I met her in Lahore. She came to my home. I was a practicing lawyer. Uh, she was a young girl there. I still have a photograph with me of her sitting. in a corner i gave it to her one copy years later those were the days when she sat as a silent young girl which who everyone ignored yeah well she sat there she had no words to say and it reminded me of loya's description of her, <laughs> of her as a uh, gungi guria uh, later doll. on later on as you got to know her as prime minister what was she like i quite uh, liked her because for one she was very easy on the eye i she was very good looking girl and i once quoted lines of Helia Bella uh, for her describing her her face was like the king's command when all the swords are drawn you don't have to describe her looks but there was something imperious about her dignified uh, and she was very particular about the way she looked she dressed very well and she had a kind of uh, 
dignity that I haven't seen in other people. That's at a distance. She fell terribly from grace during the emergency. What went wrong? Was it a fault in her character? I think it was mainly because she was embarrassed by what was being said about Sanjay, her son, uh, dealings, his Maruti car project, and she was being attacked in Parliament all the time and rapidly losing ground. Uh, and I think at one time in the, the judgment of the Allahabad High Court, you know, which deprived of her vote in Parliament, it was a silly kind of judgment. And uh, instead of fighting it out, uh, she succumbed to the temptation from off her advisors, people like Siddharth Shankar Ray and her own son, Sanjay, uh, to declare an emergency and lock up all the opposition parties. Sanjay was really her weakness. Sanjay was a bit of a bully. He was a very lovable boy, but uh, he was a very dominant character. I think she was quite scared of the fellow. It was her son, but uh, he really ruled the place. He was polite and courteous to her, but uh, she couldn't cross his path. You used to admire him. You often wrote admiring of him. What was he like in his relationship with you? I liked him. I, I, I admit, and uh, he was a bit of a what would uh, a, a bit of a gunda, bit of a do-gooder. There's a combination. He was an impatient man. He knew he'd never get elected, but he wanted to run the country. And that's what he proceeded to do in the emergency. He was the ruler of this country uh, during the emergency and later when they came back to power for the short time before he... What, what about him appealed to you? Was it his strength of character, his determination? Or was it the gunda that you liked in a sort of... Well, he was a lovable gunda. <laughs> he was extremely polite and courteous to me and were almost uh, treated me like an uncle. He often turned to me for advice. And I was all for his zeal for family planning, uh, even for compulsory family planning, for cleaning slums, and you can't do them gently. You have to use bulldozers. But he also was, people said, a nefarious character. He was a toughie who broke rules to get his way. Were you, in a sense, bewitched by power? I'm not sure. I have not analyzed. I was with him at one of these uh, situations where he was uh, uh, summoned by the Shah Commission. And I went with him, and uh, it, it was really an experience I can't forget. I walked behind him and Menaka Gandhi into the court, which is already, the, it was crowded with uh, hostile factions. And as soon as he entered, they went for him, uh, physically. And he fought back, you know, he was powerful. It is, and he had his own gundas with him, so there was a free-for-all. In the courtroom, and I sought shelter behind Kiran Bedi, the police. She said, Sardar Sahib, you come and stand behind me. And while they were going at each other with tables and chairs and everything, uh, and ultimately uh, he won the day. <laughs> His gundas, that's the better of the, the rival faction. You, you got to know the family very closely at that period. And in a sense, you had a ringside view over the quarrel between Indira Gandhi and Menaka Gandhi. Yeah. What went wrong and who was to blame? Well, I think the chemistry was wrong. Right from the day Menaka entered the household, uh, uh, I think Mrs. Gandhi didn't like her. She, he, she thought her son had married below their, uh, their types, which is really quite wrong, because she came from a very respected uh, uh, le family of landowners and cattle breeders. Her uh, grandfather was knighted by the British. So I think there Mrs. Gandhi was wrong, but she could never find anything right with him. And Menaka often complained to me about her belittling her all the time in front of Sonia. I remember once after Sanjay uh, was killed in the uh, air accident, she told me of a party she had for Mrs. Thatcher, a uh, lunch party, where Rajiv and Sonia were sat on the main table and she was sat with the staff, with R.K. Dhawan and others. So a lot of the fault for that breakup of relationship lies with Mrs. Gandhi in your eyes. She was really behaved like a village mother-in-law. Uh, amongst other things, she'd bring things like Pandit Nehru's uh, pen or watch, and in front of Menaka, uh, tell Sonia, Sonia, I'd rather you had these things of my father's as mementos, leaving Menaka out. And this, these were hurtful things to do, and she was constantly doing them. Your son has gone on record to say that and he said this with particular reference to your relationship with the Gandhi, that my father's politics is run by the heart, not the head. His re reactions are emotional, not rational. 
He's a fool when it comes to politics. Yeah, I've noticed he said that. He had the liberty of saying that. Uh, why I supported uh, Sanjay, I've told you. If I were in a position of power, I'd make family planning compulsory in this country. I'd remove slums by force, and I'd make the country green by forcing everyone to plant trees everywhere and stop the cremation of the dead by wood. Uh, I feel very strongly in these things, but I'm not in a position of power to enforce them. But Sanjay took up some of Sanjay those. took up. I, I think one thing he agreed to do was a plant a forest in Delhi in my father's memory. We were going to finance. And fortunately for me, even after he died, Menaka carried out the wish. We laid the foundation. She laid the foundation stone. And there are about 10,000 trees there now. Let's, let's turn briefly to yourself. You've revealed something of yourself in your explanation of why you were close to Sanjay in particular. You write that I'm not a nice man to know. People think you're one of the nicest people in the country <laughs> to know. I mean, are you being unduly well, modest? Are you being hard? It, it worked. I made you, I've, I've made you say that to me instead of my saying it. <laughs> so, so the description of yourself is full of guile, is it? <laughs> well, yes, but also I, I do things which uh, other people don't do. For instance, when I write obituaries, uh, I, if the person was a nasty man, if he was corrupt, I say so. And the fact that he died doesn't make him into a saint in my eyes. And so people go for me, say, this fellow doesn't even spare the dead. So why should I spare the dead? If the fellow was corrupt in life, well, he remains corrupt. And his memory should be uh, fully recorded as a man who rose out of corruption. When you meet your maker, as all of us must one day, and he looks upon you and he says, Kushwan Singh, account for your time on earth, what will you say to him? Well, you know, uh, I'm a non-believer, so I don't think there is a maker. <laughs> I don't think it's a rebirth. There is no day of judgment, no heaven or hell. But let I know that death is inevitable, and I let me end by quoting my favorite lines, and summing up my, I think they are by Walter Savage Landor. I strove with none, for none was worth my strife. Nature I loved, and next to nature art. I warm my hands before the fire of life. It sinks and I'm ready to depart. Death is a full stop. But looking back on your life, has it been a happy, content, fulfilled one, or are there still things you want to achieve? Oh, I go? would have liked to write, have written the definitive novel in India. I haven't done it. I have no time left to do it. Uh, but when I feel depressed that I wasted a life, uh, I open up this uh, long, two yard long scroll which I got from the Library of Congress at Washington, listing the number of books I'd written, books, tracts, pamphlets, they run to over 85. So now. when you're depressed, you look at your own achievements and you say, it's been worth it. That's right. <laughs> Krishan Singh, for this wonderful interview, thank you very thank much you. indeed. <laughs> thank you.